seminary, I took a course on hermeneutics, which is like theories of interpretation. And uh, this was a, a pretty new course at the seminary. In fact, the semester in which I took it was only the second semester that it was being offered. But because of some curriculum changes, it was a required course. And so I changed degrees and couldn't get grandfathered in, so now I have to take hermeneutics. So there I am taking that course. And at the end of the semester, we had a final exam. And so you know, final exams in seminary are pretty rare. Typically, you write a paper at the end of the course instead of taking an exam. And so, uh, except for maybe like Greek classes, I wasn't really accustomed to taking a final. And uh, in our hermeneutics class, we got to do both. We got to take an exam and write a paper. So lucky us, right? The best of both worlds. So the day of the test, I remember my classmates and I, we were all pretty nervous because, again, we're not used to taking exams in these kinds of courses. And we'd actually heard from the students who took the class in the previous semester that it was a pretty challenging test. The School of Theology at AU was, it was pretty small. Word got around. And so I'm pretty sure that our professor, a uh, man by the name of Dr. Greg Robertson, knew we were all a little nervous about, about taking this test. And so there we are in the classroom, the day of the exam, the papers have all been passed out, we've got our pencils in hand, we're ready to go, and we're just waiting from the, for the word from the professor to get started. And he stops and he says, hey, let's bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. And good thing about seminary classes, you usually get to start off with a little prayer. So we bowed our heads, and this is how Dr. Robertson led us in prayer. Dear God, help! <laughs> Amen. So that's the prayer of Greg Robertson. I started off today by praying the prayer of St. Francis, which I just, he had, he had to have been frank to his friends, right? I, anyway, so... Um, I, I started today with the prayer of St. Francis because I wanted to create a little contrast. And, of course, I've been leading that prayer a lot here in our worship recently because I truly believe that the prayer of St. Francis is a wonderful prayer of the church because it really gets at the heart of who God is and who we ought to be because of who God is, and it asks for the author of grace to help us in being that person. And, of course, the prayer of Frank is also, uh, it's very eloquent, it's poetic, it's pleasing to the ear. But the prayer of Greg Robertson, dear God, help! That is truly one for the ages. And I know that I'm being a little facetious, and so maybe I'm actually giving the wrong impression. So kidding aside, I would propose that that prayer that our professor offered that day uh, was actually a great prayer. And why is that? What did that prayer accomplish? So there we had a classroom full of seminary students. And I'm going to switch to like the present tense. It seems a little more awkward. So we're a, we're a classroom full of students. That's an important word, right? We're all there. We're open to the way that God is working in our lives. But we're still students. We're still learning and growing. And there we are. We're in pursuit of, of what it is that... God is doing in our lives. We're wanting to be better servants of our Lord. And what is it that we're nervous about but just a silly little test? And what the prayer of, of Greg Robertson did in that moment was to remind us that we are in relationship with God. And that God is, in fact, with us no matter where we are or what we are doing. Any prayer throughout our day can do that. It can remind us of those things. It can remind us of the fact that we are in relationship with God, that God is with us no matter where we are or what we are doing. So lovely and eloquent prayers like that of St. Francis, of Frank, or, or ones that we might come up with on our, on our own that kind of are eloquent and nice and pleasing to the ear, they can certainly uh, do that. They can have a place in our prayer life, but we should never feel like we aren't praying properly if we aren't praying like that. 
So today is, of course, the fourth Sunday of the month, and recently we've been setting aside the fourth Sunday of the month to focus on prayer. And that's been a relatively recent change that we've done here at the church. And so I'm still kind of navigating and figuring out what precisely that looks like for us. But I've been listening, and I've heard some things that a, a few members of our church have said recently, and I've gotten the sense that that they would like to have a little bit more teaching and preaching on the topic of prayer. And so we're going to use this particular fourth Sunday of the month to launch a short sermon series on the topic of prayer. And we'll return to our sermon series in Luke a little bit later in the summer. But if you would like more time in group prayer, I would remind you that we do have a, a Wednesday night prayer meeting every Wednesday at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And another great prayer ministry we have here at the church is our prayer chain. And if you're not a part of that, uh, let me know. I can get you plugged in or talk to Sue. Sue, wave at everyone. Yeah, Sue can get you plugged into that too. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we started today by looking at two examples of prayer that were quite a bit different from one another. The prayer of Greg Robertson and the prayer of St. Francis. And we talked a little bit about why they are both great prayers. So let's kind of take a step back and let's do this. Let's just ask this question. What, what is prayer? And that might be a little bit more difficult of a, a question to answer than you might think. So we can start maybe by saying that prayer is a spiritual discipline, which is okay to say. I don't think that's incorrect. But a problem with that idea of prayer as a discipline is a discipline is something that we don't always do naturally. It's something that we perhaps force ourselves to do or we do it out of obligation because we know it's supposed to be good for us. I've heard people make a joke that you never see uh, somebody out on a jog that looks happy, right? You go jogging because it's supposed to be good for you. Uh, of course, I don't think that's true. I actually enjoy exercise, but, you know... Anyway, so it, it would be my hope that we could get to a place where prayer is no longer a discipline, something we force ourselves to do or do out of obligation, but something that comes naturally to us. An example that David Benner, who is the author of a wonderful book called Opening to God, he uses this example that says children don't need to be told to play. It's something that they just do naturally. It's something that comes natural to them. It's only adults who maybe later in life get so wrapped up in the work life and the busyness of life that play perhaps becomes a discipline, something they have to force themselves to practice, something that might actually be good for some of us to spend some more time in play. But it would be great if our approach to prayer was like a child's approach to play. And I'm should take a moment here. I mentioned that author David Benner and his wonderful book, Opening to God, and I should just give credit and, and let you know that a lot of uh, our sermon today is inspired by that work uh, by him, and that's a, a great book that I would recommend um, if you're looking for a way to uh, just understand prayer a little bit differently and be open, more open to the way God is working in your life. Uh, David Benner, Opening to God. Okay, so we've said that prayer is a spiritual discipline. What else can we say uh, in response to the question, what is prayer? The dictionary definition says prayer is an address or petition to God in word or thought. And yeah, okay, that is prayer. But couldn't our definition of prayer include so much more than that? Prayer could take the form of reading a passage of Scripture and listening to God's personal word for you in it. Meditatively walking the stations of the cross. Lighting a candle in church or your home. Allowing music to draw your spirit towards God's spirit. Affirming your beliefs by reading or reciting the creeds. Reviewing your day and noticing where and how God has uh, oh, how God was present to you in your, in your day. Meditating on scripture and, and thinking about its meaning for your life. 
working prayer beads in your fingers as a framework for meditation, allowing your hunger during a fast to draw your attention towards God, recalling your blessings and responding with gratitude, celebration of communion or the Eucharist or the Last Supper or whatever name you might know it by, going for a, a long rambling walk while repeating a simple prayer such as, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, Confessing your sins and asking for forgiveness. Smelling incense during a liturgy and having your spirit drawn towards God. A contemplative walk in the forest that moves you from self-preoccupation to God consciousness. Making the sign of the cross or bowing before an altar or crucifix. Sitting in silence and allowing your heart to be drawn to God by the periodic gentle repetition of a love name for God. Reading liturgical or other written prayers, meditatively speaking the Lord's Prayer, attending to your breathing, drawing in God with each inhalation, allowing your mind or, or, and spirit to turn toward God as you hear church bells or see a lit candle or any of the infinite number of things that can remind you to call your attention to God. Singing or pondering the words of a favorite song or a hymn, Allowing your heart to soar in unworded praise and response to a sunset, a, a, a storm. I did that this morning. A flower or a tree. To quote uh, Bubba from Forrest Gump, I think that's about it. Actually, probably not. I could probably come up with more. Now, admittedly, some of those things in that long list of things that I just named off, they might, some of those things I know may sound a little strange to you. I mean, depending on your upbringing, on your denominational background, maybe on some of your own personal thoughts about God and so on, some of those things I listed off may be way outside of your spiritual comfort zone. Some of them might not even make sense to you. What's a liturgy? What are the stations of the cross? What are the creeds? Yet none of those are my own invention. Those are all forms of prayer that Christians across major divisions of the church and across centuries of Christian tradition have found richly rewarding. So how can prayer be more than a discipline? How can all of those things we listed off fall under the definition of prayer? I'm reminded of uh, many great passages of Scripture that we can read which remind us about how God's Holy Spirit dwells within us. Greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. The Apostle Paul talks about how God's Spirit acts as a witness to our spirits. The Apostle tells us that, uh, that the Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf in our weakness in moments when we don't know how to pray as we ought to. So I think part of why it can be hard for us to see prayer as something more than a discipline and to let it be something that comes naturally is that we think of it too often as something that we do. Instead, because of God's Spirit that is in us, can we think of prayer as less of something we do and more of something that God does in us? Our role in prayer has less to do with initiative and more to do with giving consent. And what is it that we're giving consent to? It's simply having an encounter with God. Having an encounter with the God that loves us. I think that that invitation to have that encounter with God is always present because of God's Spirit in us. All we have to do is... is open ourselves to God, turn to God in faith. And so, um, just as a reminder, I've put those, those big points up on the screen. Since God's Spirit is in us, prayer is less something we do and more something that God does in us. And our role in prayer has less to do with initiative and more to do with giving consent. And what it is we're giving consent to is to simply having an encounter with God who loves us.
And that is also how it is that that long list of things that I rattled off a few minutes ago can all be considered prayer. Because we can, and people certainly have testified to having encounters with God and doing all of those things. But none of those things we listed off is automatically prayer. I think not even that, that dictionary definition of prayer, that idea of addressing petitions to God in word or thought, is necessarily prayer. It may look and sound like prayer, but it can still look and sound like prayer without actually being prayer. What makes the difference is whether or not our heart is in the right place, to use that cliché. Prayer must involve faithfully opening ourselves to God, who, who can do, as the Scripture tells us, abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So we're opening ourselves to a God that can do abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. When prayer begins in the heart and is offered by an act of opening ourselves to God and turning to God in faith, then it's genuine prayer. Prayer must involve faithfully opening ourselves to God, who can do abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine. When prayer begins in the heart and is offered by an act of opening ourselves to God and turning to God in faith, then it is genuine prayer. And when I think of prayer that begins in the heart and involves opening ourselves to God and turning to God in faith, I think about a, a great example of, of what we're talking about is in Jesus' teaching about worry and the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus tells us that when we're concerned about what we will wear, we should consider the incredible beauty that can be found in a field of wild flowers. And be reminded that even Solomon and all of his royal regalia, I wish I could, knew how to roll my R's, royal regalia, was not clothed as splendidly as that field of wildflowers. So this is an invitation to trust that since this is how God clothes the grass, clothes the grass of the fields, God's care for us will be even more unimaginably extravagant. Consider the lilies of the field. Let's consider a, a way that prayer is often taught to kids or to people who are new to the Christian faith. And this, by the way, is a great way of teaching prayer, especially as sort of an introduction. That's why we teach it to, to kids and to people who are new to the faith. And that is that prayer is a conversation with God. We can talk to God in much the same way we would talk to anybody. From that understanding of prayer, we can develop a, a, a wonderful practice of talking to God throughout the course of our day. Every day. And often these prayers can take the form of just quick bullet point prayers. The prayer of Greg Robertson, Dear God, Help! Amen. Even just help would have been enough so long as it's coming from a heart that was open to God in faith. Those little talks with God throughout the day, they could involve a, a brief moment in which you give thanks to God for something or someone or a brief moment of intercession. Even as I've been preaching this sermon, you know... <laughs> The mind of John Stimrick just goes a million miles a second. Even as I'm preaching this sermon, I'm in my head, I'm thinking of, of Professor Robertson. I'm thanking God for all of the ways that he impacted my life, all of the things that he taught me, and praying a blessing over him and his family. Can you remember one of the first people who ever taught you about prayer? Take a moment, even just in, in your head, silently to yourself, to thank God for putting that person in your life. For all the things that they taught you. If they're still living, pray a prayer of intercession for them. What a prayer to God throughout the day like that can do is it, it can provide us 
uh, or, or prayers to God throughout your day like this. They, they can provide us with ample opportunities to open our hearts to God in faith. They can remind us constantly of God's love for us and that we are, in fact, in relationship with God and that God is present in every moment and in every aspect of our lives, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. So try offering short bullet point prayers throughout your day. They can take the form of giving thanks, uh, a moment of intercession, intercession, or uh, even just asking for help. Perhaps you've, you do find, you know, I started off by talking about prayer as a discipline. I said the problem with that is sometimes it's something we do out of a sense of duty or because we think it's what we're supposed to do, that sort of thing. It, if your prayer life does feel like more than duty, or more like duty than devotion, if that's the case, don't be discouraged. But at the same time, don't allow yourself to become content with that. David Benner writes, Remember that prayer is more a matter of consent than initiative. Trust that your prayer relationship with God has been established by God's initiative, not yours. Your part is simply making space for God. Turning to God with attentiveness and openness. Don't think of this as an obligation. Hear it as an invitation to abundant and true life. Hear it as an invitation to the encounter in love that is prayer. And he goes on. Settle for nothing less than knowing God in love. This begins by knowing the depths of God's love for you. All of us needs to regularly return to this knowing. In fact, you can never get enough of it. Everything else that is required of you in life, your love of God, yourself, and others, all flows out of your personal knowing of God's extravagant love for you. And that's, uh, I can say this because I didn't write it, that's pretty good preaching right there. I couldn't have said it even better myself. Uh, I really th believe that the love of God for us must be the starting place for any spiritual growth in our lives. If we want our prayer life to change, if we want to be freed from some, some habit that is weighing us down, if we want to grow closer to God, it has to start in that place of recognizing that we are... Um, that we are loved immensely, that we are loved without limit, with, uh, without limit, without any expectations of us, without any conditions, that we are simply loved by God. And that's why back even at the end of this last year when we did a sermon series kind of leading up to Advent about spiritual formation, I said if you, if you get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season and, and you don't set aside time to reflect on anything at all, just set aside time to reflect on that one thing of what it means that you are loved without limit or condition. For us to... For us to be able to live up to the greatest commandment, that is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself, we'll never get there if we don't start with God's love for us. No spiritual growth can happen without knowing that we are loved by God without limit or condition. So let me just leave off by asking a couple of questions for reflection. And then in the coming week, we're going to pick up right where we're leaving off this week. So these are some things that you can maybe reflect upon in the week to come. Just ask, think about how would you describe your communication with God? And then ask yourself, does conversational prayer, that is brief 
bullet point prayers throughout the day form a part of it? Does it form a part of your communication with God? And if not, simply consider if there may be a possibility in that for deepening your relationship with God. Consider those things in the weeks to come, and and we'll return right where we left off next week. I'd like to close us in prayer today, and uh, I'll begin by lifting up the needs of the church and of the world, and we'll conclude our prayer, our closing prayer, with uh, Paul's prayer from the third chapter of Ephesians, which I think fits in well with what we were discussing today, or at least uh, an adapted version of, of Paul's prayer from the third chapter of Ephesians. So would you bow your heads with me? God of mercy and healing, you who hear the cries of those in need, receive these petitions of your people, that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. Lord, today we lift up those who are grieving. Uh, I know that our church has uh, suffered a great deal of loss recently, and so we just continue to pray for um, the families of Jean DeWitt, and the, the family of Sarah Deaton, and of, uh, of, of Dreama, and of Tina, and that loss being so recent, and, and just two tragedies that uh, the same family experienced all at once. And so, Lord, we just pray for those who are, are suffering loss, who are uh, mourning, who are experiencing grief. We pray, Lord, that you would come alongside them, that your presence would speak love into their lives, that you would bind up their hearts, that you would provide them that pe- with the kind of peace that only you can provide, Lord. Give us peace like shalom, the uh, presence of mind and knowing that Everything is as God has ordained it to be. That, Lord, remind us that in every aspect of our lives, you are present and active. You are with us. We are in relationship with you, no matter where we are or what we are doing. We, uh, today, Lord, we pray for the world. We pray for those who are, are victims of violence around the world those who are affected by hunger, those who are affected by, um, by disease, Lord. We just pray uh, as, as, as the scripture tells us, even in our weakness when we don't know how to pray, we're grateful that your spirit intercedes on our behalf with sighs too deep for words, Lord. We believe as the scripture tells us that your whole creation is groaning for your return, Lord. And so we just pray for you to come and to heal the world, Lord. We pray that you would use us, your church, as an instrument of that healing until the day that you come, Lord. We think of uh, those in the mission field who are working tirelessly, that are working in in dangerous conditions, that are um, so dedicated to loving others well and to sharing the kingdom of God with others. We pray that you would keep them safe, encourage them, and continue to give their ministries fruits. Life-giving God, heal our lives that we may acknowledge your wonderful deeds and offer you thanks from generation to generation through Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant that we may be strengthened in our inner beings with power through God's Spirit and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith as we are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that we may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, To God the Father be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.